Thank you very much. Uh, first, Sophia, for doing the introduction short. Um, also, like to thank the organizers for asking me to discuss this paper. Uh, there are two big reasons for that. One is that this paper called my attention since the first time that I saw it presented uh, somewhere, probably the Summer Institute. Uh, I thought that it was an important paper to keep in the radio for the agenda of the bank, so I suggested that this paper could be presented in our webinar series. Uh, this is something that happened, and, and, and the reason is because I think that this is a typical Valerie, this is typical Valerie, basically stepping, seeing one literature, getting one step back, breathe a little bit, and try to think out of the box. And this is exactly what this paper is doing. The second big reason I feel uh, honored to discuss this paper is uh, having the opportunity to discuss on Valerie. This is like, uh, I don't know, like an average tennis player like myself uh, commenting on the game of one of the top uh, players that you can only see from, uh, on TV. This is a little bit like that. Uh, anyway, so let's, let's start. Um, okay, so let me start with a spoiler. This is going to be an enthusiastically uh, supported discussion. If I have to, uh, so don't expect so much criticism on the details, and I just I, I want to talk a little bit about the big picture. Uh, on that, if I have to uh, summarize the paper in one bullet, this will be the bullet. So when using microestimate uh, MPCs in a macro model, be careful, handle with care. So what I'm going to do, the plan for today, uh, for me, is to review the main points of the paper scattered with some thoughts. So let me start with a bird eye uh, view of the paper. The paper start, start from the observation that estimated micro MPCs in a standard macro model produce suspiciously too strong I8 counterfactuals. In particular, what it does is that it, uh, it makes that the uh, rebate, the 2008 rebates are going to have an extremely large effect on uh, aggregate consumption, which is something that Valerie uh, spent part of the paper suggesting that is implausible uh, according to uh, history, according to forecast, and uh, try to. Uh, and then she come up with uh, two possibilities uh, to reconcile this a little bit strange counterfactual relative to uh, the way that could be fixed. So one possibility is that estimating micro objects in general is tough. MPCs are not exception. So she argues that one possibility is that there is some upward bias in the estimation. I will come back to that uh, later. The second possibility, which is complement to the previous one, is that those estimates are really micro MPCs. But what we really care for this counterfactual is the macro MPCs, which may, they may not be the same. So she pushes that general equilibrium may make a difference. I argue that uh, aggregation may also make a difference. And the paper then argues that uh, counterfactual pass the smell test when the upward bias in the micro MPC estimates are corrected and when some GE forces are introduced into the model to create a wedge between the micro MPCs and the macro relevant MPCs. The particular GE forces that she's put it in is uh, durables in a, in a tank model. So for durable, think about cars, and, uh, and again, I'll, be, I'll come back to that a little bit later. But the reason why I like this paper so much it's actually beyond the discussion of MPCs and beyond the discussion about the heterogeneous ages model. It's, about a, it's a methodological point about how we sh should think about uh, when we uh, look at micro data to inform models. And this is what I mean. Models, at the end of the day, are there to perform counterfactuals. Make micro data is useful in the extent that it informs counterfactuals. So we never should look, should forget 
uh, uh, that perspective when we look at the exciting new things that microdata bring us, could bring to, to macro. Of course, which counterfactuals depends on the question that we have at hand. And this is what I, what I mean, is that quite too often we see papers, to be honest, including some of my own papers, that do the following. They document some micro uh, features that look interesting, add some degrees of freedom to a standard macro model, claim success, then do counterfactuals using the model, and never look at the data again. So what this paper is suggesting, is inviting us, is that after we do this, go back to the data, but not to any data. Go back to the data and evaluate inputs from microdata in the extent that they produce plausible counter counterfactuals. This is no different than just saying that we need some external validity. But it's not any external validity. It's not untargeted moments. Is basically look at the counterfactuals that we can estimate and we could have like a good sense of what we should get out of those counterfactuals and contrast our models where they give us something that, again, passed the smell test. So now let me look at a little bit in more details about the paper in particular and about the um, heterogeneous agent models. So this idea that micro MPCs may be too high from a macro perspective is something that is not unique of MPCs. It's something that we have seen before. So the discussion about risk aversion has that flavor. Micro uh, risk aversion seems to be much higher than what makes sense for a macro model. The same thing happened with the fridge elasticity. So in that sense, it shouldn't surprise us that micro estimates don't give us the full picture of what a macro uh, MPCs or what is consistent, the macro evidence with, uh, uh, with, with MPCs. So talking a little bit about the model, and this is the only thing I'm going to say about the model, it's kind of easy to shoot at the paper because it's a tank model. I mean, some people argue that tank model give you a lot, allow you to go a lot, a long, long way of what a, a heterogeneous agent, mo a hang model is going to give you. Some of those people are in this room. On the other hand, some other people said, no, no, no. If you do a tank, you're going to missing some important ingredients. Some of those people are also in this room. Uh, but beside that, really, I, I see this as an example. I said, like, a, we, let's take a simple model, let's add some ingredients, let's see whether those ingredients can change, can create a wedge between the micro MPC and the macro MPC, drive it by uh, GE forces. And the particular mechanism in the paper is about adding durables. Again, think about cars. And the mechanism is the following as rebates increase uh, demand for durables, Prices of durable should go up. Key in the mechanism is that the expectation is that the increase of the price of durables is short-lived. So, rational agents, what they should do, they should smooth out their demand of, of durables in a way that we won't see that big spike in uh, consumption when those agents get their rebate. In the model, a price spike of only 1%, which is consistent with what Valerie documents in the paper, is enough to produce substantial delay in the demand of durables, and thus justify the fact that there is this big wedge between the micro MPC and the macro MPCs. In the preferable estimation and calibration, the micro MPC is 0.3, the macro MPC is 0.2. So, about the model, this is just one model. This is one example. We can think of other examples. But we can think also on other questions. But I think the point stands. We should look at, uh, we should use counterfactuals that we can measure and estimate in the data in a reasonable way to use them as external validity for which micro-ingredients we should add to our models. So aggregate consumption response, for sure, it's, uh, it's, an, it's an important question. But it's not the only one. 
And one may be interested, for instance, in welfare, or may be interested between the interplay of monetary policy or some other type of policy with the, with the rebates. Then the answer may not be exactly the same that Valerie got, but the methodological point stands, which we always do what Valerie uh, is doing here. And uh, so if we have these other questions, and this, what I'm, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to push a little bit Valerie's argument a little bit, uh, a little bit to the limit, is that we should not contempt ourselves looking only at uh, micro counterfactuals as a external validity for our models. We could also use the richness of uh, cross-sectional variation to do that. And that is maybe particularly important if we want to use microdata to inform models and to inform uh, how we should think about mechanisms in, for those questions for, for which the mechanism may be important. For instance, we could have, unfortunately, the, my understanding that the literature of MPC is not being so successful on related heterogeneity on MPC with observables. But in principle, that is one way to go. It could also be related with geographical variation and some observable characteristic of those regions can give us a lot of information about what is really the nature of the heterogeneity of MPCs and therefore why MPCs can be high in some times and, and low in others, or high for some groups and, and small for others. For instance, if financial frictions are behind the micro MPC, we should observe that some measurement of financial frictions, of the extent of financial frictions affecting agents, should uh, be correlated with the MPCs. Also, if it's true that financial frictions are related to, uh, to the nature of MPCs, that is going to be very informative for either for some, some questions that we may have that may not be related to the bottom with the question that this paper is, is putting forward. For instance, there could be the interplay between different type of policies uh, at the time of the rebase, go through uh, relaxing or tightening financial constraint if financial constraints are basically the main drivers of, uh, of MPCs. That's just one example. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about the uh, MPC estimation. The bottom line point of the paper to me on, uh, on this front is that asynchronous rebates create upward bias when diff and diff estimates include, include in the control group those who already got it. To be honest, it was a little bit surprising to me that uh, Valerie had to make this observation. My, my understanding was that it's the standard in diff and diff estimates when there is a, 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 a synchronity in, in the treatment is to exclude those who have been already treated, but it seems that it's not. So what Valerie does is that uh, excluding those already treated uh, substantially reduces uh, diff and diff uh, estimate. However, to my taste, so this is what, is the, uh, what is the message that we get, is that uh, MPC is probably smaller than we think, and the, some models are being calibrated to too high MPCs, but there are quite a few papers out there which cal are calibrated to uh, average MPCs that are not so different from the micro MPCs that Valerie is finding in her work. So to me, the, really the main, main contribution comes from Let's think about what ingredients are going to give a wedge between the micro MPCs and the macro MPCs, and this is something that we should add into the models. Uh, this is something that I already mentioned. Uh, uh, the empirical literature, I think, uh, could move forward a little bit on, on that front, which would be very, very informative, very, very useful. Uh, there is also the possibility that Typically, when we teach macro, we say that it's different than micro for two reasons. We don't need to, basically, we don't need to care all the, we don't need to include all the richness of micro data because that may not survive two forces, aggregation and general equilibrium. Valerie pushes forward the general equilibrium part, but there also could be some story behind the aggregation which is going to be related to understanding what uh, observables might be correlated with uh, the dispersion of MPC across region or across different individuals. And, uh, and again, 
if we can relate these estimates of MPCs, of heterogeneity MPCs, may help us to guide modeling. And that's going to be very, very useful, very informative. Again, what I'm doing here is putting pushing forward exactly the same argument that Valerie is giving us at the aggregate level, also at the cross-sectional level, also to step back and think what are the ingredients that we need to add to the models and which of those we can ignore. So just to uh, uh, finish, I think that this is a neat general message. To be honest, it's not completely novel. What I'm saying is not, I'm sure that it's no surprise to anyone in this room, but still we see a lot of papers, a lot of work that overlook the fact that we should use external validity. The counterfactuals, not any counterfactual, not any moment, not any uh, untargeted un feature of the data, the counterfactuals that we can measure that are closely related to the questions that we have in mind and the reason why we build these models, because we build them to do counterfactuals. And uh, in the context of heterogeneous agent models, micro MPCs are less important than you think for some questions. They may remain important for others, and this is for us, for all of us to investigate. So thank you so much. Okay, so now we have some time for questions. Yes, please, Jonathan. It was a super interesting paper, and I hadn't seen it. I was, it was really, really interesting. I, I was thinking of more about this 83% spending on durables feature. I mean, I was wondering, firstly, is are we still confident that that is a, that is a fact, that we can measure that right, and we got it right? And then, and then I was wondering, in your model, are you, are you replicating that somehow? Um, maybe it just happens endogenously. I was thinking, if you have these hand-to-mouth people, Maybe if you give them a rebate, what they want to spend the money is, is, on, is on durables because it's a way for them to save. Well, they're not allowed to save in, in traditional means, but a, a durable gives them a consumption flow moving forward. So maybe it just falls out of your model, or, or are you somehow kind of... Is there some other parameter you're using to kind of get that 83% feature right? And I, I thought that... Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agreed also with uh, Ernesto's point about aggregation. You, you said that some of these rebates didn't go to the top of the income distribution. Those are probably people who account for a disproportionate share of aggregate consumption. So that would be another natural way to get a smaller sort of macro response than you get from the aggregate. Thank you. Yeah, I understand. So in your conclusion, you mentioned there were two ways to get rid of the V shape. You could have um, GE dampening or, or smaller MPCs. And it, it occurred to me that there's a third way, which is to have some kind of GE smoothing effect. And that seems quite plausible, and Ernesto kind of touched on that. And I think that would have a sort of different implication in terms of policy in the, just if it's just pure dampening, then these rebates don't stimulate demand. If it's smoothing, they do, but it just comes later. So I was wondering if you have a sense of in the model whether or not this smoothing is playing a role or if it's really just pure dampening. Uh, sorry. Nice paper. Um, <laughs> so, uh, since Ernesto brought up this tank versus uh, Hank uh, question, I think this is an application where it actually does make a very big difference. Uh, because there's two things that you don't like about the counterfactual in your tank model. One is that it's a V shape. And one is the ma is the other one is the magnitude. So on the v the V shape is entirely driven by tank. So if you had a Hank model, these uh, tax rebates they'd be spent over time, over a relatively long period of time. And so actually your macro counterfactual would be prolonged. It'd be it'd be much it'd be much smoother uh, than the V shape that you get. So this is a place where it does matter. It also matters when you're thinking about the the micro estimation of MPCs later, because this is this, it's pers this persistence in the spending response of people that got the transfer in the past is also what's creating this wedge in the estimation. So I think it's like, it's a place where it does really matter. Now it's true that 
you still have the magnitude point, which is this is a really big magnitude. So in a in a in a one good Hank model, um, the kind of factual uh, would be there'd be enormous amplification, uh, and so you still need something to dampen the general equilibrium. And so I think that the way you're doing it is uh, is 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 a, is, a, is a very nice way. It's, an, it's a nice point, um, but but I do think that for the V shape alone, uh, Hank is actually one way to get rid of that. Thank you, uh, Valerie. Very nice paper and also a uh, very insightful discussion. Uh, my quick question is on prices. So, so you, you motivated uh, several times this idea of, uh, of uh, imperfectly in el elastic supply curve with the uh, plot on prices, right? But you, I wonder if you have explored in the model whether uh, the model can account for this price uh, spike because uh, it, it, it would seem to me that this is an important uh, metric uh, in terms of the performance of the model, especially if you want to push the idea uh, about the supply curve. Thank you. Um, so I, I haven't reread my paper with Greg in a long time, so <laughs> there are uh, some things I remember other than I remember well, but I, I seem to remember that um, in that table that you mentioned, um, so depending on whether the control group was, um, you know, the ones who were treated or the ones who were not yet treated, then you could get biases in all directions. So for example, if the control group are, are the not yet treated, uh, which uh, it seems like w uh, what, what um, you, you, you do in, in one of your, um, your uh, uh, columns at least, then if there is an anticipation effect, Right? And the division effect is, is large, then there will be a downward bias uh, because um, you know, at the time in which you receive the news, you increase consumption. And so you're comparing essentially the treated with a group that is also increasing consumption because of the news. Um, so depending on the size of anticipation effect, you can get a downward bias there. Now, my recollection from Broda and Parker is that they don't find large anticipation effects. So maybe that's not a, you know, not a large uh, downward bias. And certainly the, the, uh, the uh, Upper bias is, is obviously there, and it's probably very large because of the declining consumption growth. So, yeah. In the audience, Luciano, and then Jorge. Thank you. Um, very nice presentation and very nice discussion. Very insightful. Uh, have two questions related to the empirical part. Well, one question has been already asked by uh, Gianluca. So the second one is is related about. Um, so what I see, what creates a problem in the two-way fixed effect is this heterogeneous effects of, of the, the treatment. No? Um, according to macro models, why we should think on heterogeneous effects in these NPCs? Maybe because of some differences in, in state variables, no? in assets, maybe in age. I wonder if you can actually control for this if you see a, a, a important differences between the, the two-way fixed effects and your proposed methods. So once you control for observed heterogeneity if you want in some state variables that could create heterogeneity in the NPCs, whether you still uh, find the, the differences between the two methodologies. Oh, hi, uh, this is Jorge here from the bank. Very nice uh, paper and, and discussion. So uh, there is one thing that calls my attention. So in the data, April, June, you don't see much of the consumption going down. So it's, it's kind of after. So even though you reduce the MPC to 0.1, still you might not get the timing right. And there I was thinking uh, some of the things I'm working on might be relevant <laughs> there. Because you have this asymmetry that households, even though they have income declines or they expect that, they don't want to decrease consumption. They have this minimum consumption thresholds that are relevant for them, right? They don't want to move out of the house or sell the car, etc. And that might help matching at least that part of the, the smooth, uh, which is related to the smoothing uh, question before. Um, that's, that's essentially my, my comment. Yes, one more question over there. Hi, 
I'm uh, Carlos Madeira from the Central Bank. Uh, I was going to ask about the policy implications uh, given this hand to mouth consumers cannot coordinate. I was wondering if there was a staggered rebate, like uh, you would get a rebate on the month of your birthday, uh, then maybe it would help smooth out this uh, large rebate uh, and one could get uh, a welfare gain, but uh, I don't know, uh, I wanted to ask. See, there I am again. I always forget the scarves are not good for microphones. Um, so first of all, I want to thank everybody for their comments, and, and particularly Ernesto, who um, is way too modest, um, and, 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 and also uh, about himself, and perhaps too laudatory about me. So my, my co-authors were absolutely key on this uh, project. Um, I like his idea. You know, he has extra uh, additional ideas on how to do things, and we'll certainly look into those. And then the heterogeneity of NPCs is something that came up in several comments, and, and that's something we're working more on right now is trying to understand that. Uh, one point I want to make, you know, now Ernesto might be really creative because he's figured out a way around this, but as far as I can see, these are historical counterfactuals, and if you're going to go to the aggregate, or you could even do it at the state level if that's the example, whatever the experiment is needs to be large. So for example, we could not use this method on, say, the Norwegian lottery results because the lottery is not big relative to the aggregate. Um, so it is limited in when you can apply it, but fortunately these days governments are just giving out huge checks, so, so we get lots of experiments um, for, from that point of view. Uh, so let's see. Uh, okay, so Jonathan, he asked, 83%, are we confident? We've, uh, that is based on our estimates and theirs. And again, this is not the overall steady state of the economy, but rather just what these robots are doing, you know, the hand to mouth. Um, and, and you could move that around some. And, it, you know, it's just going to, if we move that around, what it means is that a particular 0.3 MPC for total consumption, a different weight will be put on the durables. And so then, if we still get the V-shapes, then that would just mean that the overall MPC would have to be a different value to get rid of the V-shapes. So I think we're okay there. Now on the replicating it, we actually now, based on the really good uh, feedback we got at summer, MBR Summer Institute last summer, we now generate households from our model and estimate, uh, estimate MPCs on that and make sure that we get the same timing that uh, our, you know, Parker and then our new estimates get on that. So we're really trying to keep it consistent that way. So even though our micro foundation isn't great necessarily, you know, we're really not trying to explain micro level data, but rather this disconnect, um, we're at least making sure it's consistent in our model, our, with our macro model. So we don't think that there's too much coming from that, from that 83%. Um, you asked if there's another parameter, we'll look into that. So Alice, Alastair said, uh, the GE smoothing could come later. So, so let me try to clarify what you're trying to say there, is that um, the GE, can you, say, can you say that again? Because that was a good point. So, in order to avoid the V-shape. V-shape, yeah. You could have that they don't spend. That they don't spend. Or you could that they have that they spend later that they spend, but, but see, our households have to follow that path that we see that they spend immediately, you know, two thirds, I mean, we have it one third, one third, one third. So it would be hard to have that spending by households and yet still get this G smoothing isn't, later. Isn't that one third, one, what, that's a partial equilibrium timing. Yes, yes. So, and so, so the GE effects would shift their, potentially shift some GE spending later, I know. We could, Yes. We yeah, yeah. I mean, we can look at that, but I think we wouldn't sort of match our, you know, simulated household stuff. But 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 we'll look at that. So, so that's a useful thing to do. So Adrian, um, you're the first because I tell people, give me a reason why we should do Hank rather than Tank because we want 
parsimony, just to make the point, and, and you made one of the best arguments, and we will look at that. So um, again, I get, you know, it's somewhat related to um, Alistair's point about the smoothing that comes from the GE, and what you're saying is it could be through the heterogeneity. So, so we, will, we will look at that. Um, and then Andres asked, um, can the model account for the price spikes in uh, durables, in particular motor vehicles? Yes, it can. In fact, that's in the paper. I just didn't have time to talk about it. So, so the reason that we picked five for the elasticity of relative durable goods supply in the extended model is because that generates that same uh, magnitude increase in um, the, the prices. Okay. So Gianluca, yeah, the anticipation. We were also worried about anticipation, and we did our own tests for it, and we couldn't find it. So, you know, if anybody wants to reject the permanent income hypothesis, or at least that, or alternatively, that households just don't believe anything the government does, and they'll spend it when it arrives, which could be an alternative, but you just don't see anticipatory spending. So, so and, you know, again, we saw that in your experiment. That's a really good paper. You should go back and read your paper. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, Luciano said, uh, he was talking about two-way fixed effects estimator. Can you control for the heterogeneity in MPCs based on observables? That is such an interesting idea, and this is kind of like estimating a state-dependent model, which I do a lot, uh, you know, at the aggregate. So one could imagine doing that. It's, you know, Jonathan Parker has an interesting paper. Is this, who are these hand-to-mouth people? And it's kind of hard to figure out, you know, patterns there. And there's a new paper by Karina Bohr and Mark Bills that I talked to Karina about briefly, but I put it on my to-read list. So, so there, you know, we see some, we might see some other observables that they've, they've come across. And then let's see, Jorge, um, the June and July, you said the spending in June and July and the asymmetry may be important. That's an intriguing thing, and, and I want to ask you about it afterwards because I think it might take a little while to, to describe it, but, that, but asymmetry is certainly an interesting idea there. And then, Carlos, the policy implications. That's a really interesting idea about having a staggered rebate so that you don't get all of those price uh, uh, effects on there. Or, or, or like... You, you know, doing it so that, you, you know, you could even have it, say, uh, uh, for industries that have a little bit of extra inventories, you know. So I can tell you all kinds of detail, if people want to hear more, about exactly what was going on in the auto industry that summer, because that rise in oil prices was doing the usual thing that I've written, published papers on, which it was shifting demand from those SUVs that the domestic companies love to build because they have a high markup, to fuel efficient cars, which the foreign companies are very good at doing. And so you have all these interesting things going on there. And, and it's sort of like those rebates on top of the increase in oil prices made it really tough to find the car you wanted, which showed up both in prices and just in low inventories there. So, so that, that's a really interesting idea. So thank you for all the great comments. <laughs>